you know, this disease has nothing to do with whether a person is good or bad at anything. It's really a health issue and not a moral issue. Welcome to a special episode of the Mid-America PTTC podcast. I'm your host, Dave Clausen, and I'm the director of the Mid-America Prevention Technology Transfer Center. Now, many of you know that September is Recovery Month, and in honor of that, we have teamed up with the Mid-America ATTC to share some recovery stories from right here in our region. Now, each episode is a unique and very personal story. We are honored to have such amazing people offer their time and share their stories with us. Now it's our hope that these stories will be a message that recovery is possible and together we are stronger. Now before we get into the content, we would also like to thank our funder, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And although funded by SAMHSA, the content of this recording does not necessarily reflect the views of SAMHSA. All right, I'd like to welcome Susan to the podcast. Susan, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. All right, the pleasure is all ours, and we're so glad that you took time out of your busy schedule to come on the show and talk to us. For those listening, would you mind sharing a little bit about yourself? Sure. My name is uh, Susan Whitmore, and I actually work in the field of addiction and recovery. I'm the president and CEO at First Call Alcohol Drug Prevention and Recovery in Kansas City, Missouri. And um, I've been with this agency for 10 years, and um, I also have been in recovery for, uh, it will be 12 years this November. So, you know, I'm really grateful for for, uh, what my experience has been both before and after I achieved a a sustained recovery, um, because it really does inform how I live my life and how I do my work. 12 years, that that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, to sort of move through and share your story a little bit, how did addiction impact you? Well, I had, um, my situation is uh, more common for women than men. It's actually a, a common experience for some women who have late onset substance use disorder. I didn't get sick with this until I was uh, middle-aged in my mid-30s. And so uh, that had a huge impact on my ability to sort of accept the fact that I had an illness and uh, it took me some time to um, really get into a sustained recovery. Women seem to be uh, physiologically different than men in terms of how they react to alcohol, especially uh, middle age and later. And so what we see with women is a lot of times the the progression of the disease happens very fast if it comes on later. And so there are a lot of women that die before they have a chance to get either get into treatment or sustain their recovery. And so what happened to me personally was really baffling because I had been, you know, I had, I I have always liked the effect of alcohol, um, but I didn't have um, what I would call hooks weren't in me, you know, it wasn't a compulsion. And then um, I was going through some things in my mid thirties and started drinking more and you know, it was during that time that I noticed that my, my uh, tolerance level changed, um, but also I would be making decisions not to drink and then I would drink and, you know, but I thought I really believed it was situational and not, not because I was an alcoholic. And I went, I started going to meetings. I knew enough about the symptoms to know that I had some of the symptoms in terms of, of uh, not being able to stop. And I went, I started going to 12 step meetings Um, But I still hadn't had a lot of the serious consequences that some of the other people experienced. And so it was easy for me to 
think that I was different, that if I just got things straightened out in my personal life, I would be fine. And what happened after that, as the disease progressed, is... I went in and out of um, abstaining from alcohol for seven years. And the last three years were particularly um, frightening and terrible because I started going to treatment. And at that point, I had no doubt that I had a substance use disorder and I needed treatment and I wanted to stop desperately. But I went to 30-day treatments a number of times. And each time I would, after treatment, I would try to put my life back together, take care. I had two children and, um, you know, I'd try to put my work life back together, my family life back together. And it, I, I couldn't sustain my recovery. And each time it got worse. I think that one of the things for women also that can be a barrier to success with treatment is that there's an incredible amount of shame that I felt uh, because I was a mother and I had been a good mother my whole life, I'm still a good mother. <laughs> but, you know, this disease has nothing to do with whether a person is good or bad at anything. It's really a health issue and not a moral issue. But when when you're going through it, it's really hard not to think that it. if I just loved my kids enough, I could stop. Um, and that shame really kept me in the relapse cycle because... I was the person who relapsed because I had relapsed because I had relapsed because I had relapsed. And of course it became something that absorbed my whole family uh, in the turmoil of the, of the disorder. And, you know, we all needed treatment at the end of the day. What finally helped me was I ended up going to a long-term treatment program. I went to a three month program in Louisiana and that was really my turning point. Um, I think for people who have late stage substance use disorder, longer treatment is really indicated and it's just hard to do the, the shorter period because your brain, is without it's different with different drugs and, and um, with alcohol, but with alcohol, it takes at least six weeks for your brain to heal and for you to start being able to absorb you know, the tenets of the program, the, the personal work that you need to do. And so a 30-day program, never, I never quite hit that mark. And so when I had 90 days to work with in a safe environment, I was really able to make my start. And that was a huge piece of it for me. And, you know, I, I'm really, really grateful that I had that opportunity because not everyone has access to treatment. And um, I don't think I would be alive today if I hadn't gone to that 90-day program. Powerful. Very powerful. Thank you for sharing. You had mentioned, you know, shame you felt as a mother and yeah. also mentioned your family. Right. You tell me a little bit about how your family and your friends would talk about, you know, your struggle with alcohol. Yeah, um, you know, it was uh, really, really difficult for my kids. My daughter was 11 when I achieved a sustained recovery. And so you could, if you do the math, seven years, you know, she was in her really formative years while I was going in and out of recovery. And, and then uh, my son was 16. And so he was a teenager, you know, it was, it was really difficult. They were incredibly worried and frightened. And my whole family, as I became more sick and as this became more baffling and as we had more, you know, incidents of relapse after treatment, it's really easy to get discouraged. And honestly, the last time I went to treatment, I almost died before that treatment um, from a combination of drugs and alcohol, and it wasn't intentional. This is a way that a lot of people with substance use disorders end up dying is, you know, they, they miscalculate what they're doing and they end up not surviving. During that time period for me, when I ended up in the hospital, you know, the, the, the social worker talking to my parents was saying, we don't know if she's going to make it. And so my dad had to call my brother and my other siblings and tell them, we don't know if Susan's going to make it. And 
it was it was absolutely wrenching for everyone who was involved. Uh, you know, I'm I'm blessed that I had a family that really wanted to support me and um, encourage me. Um, not everyone has that. By the time I got to my 90 day treatment, I had spent all my savings on the other treatments, and I spent the last bit of my savings on the first 30 days. The second 30 days, my brother paid for, and the third 30 days, my my parents paid for, and you know, not everyone has that. And so I'm very aware that I was fortunate to have the support that I did for my family. You know, my, my all of my siblings, my three siblings and my parents came to the family sessions when I was in long-term treatment. And that was a very powerful and important piece in terms of them understanding uh, the science of, of substance use disorders and what's going on and also the seriousness of my condition, they had an opportunity to process a lot of the feelings of what they had been going through. Both of my children, um, I made sure, ended up in counseling. Here at First Call, where I work, we're huge on that this is a family disease and we want to make sure everyone gets the treatment they need and the support that they need because sometimes people who are impacted by a loved one's substance use are actually in worse shape than the person who needs the recovery services um, because people end up, just like with the disease, you know, that people end up isolated, um, having trouble eating, they may have PTSD. If you're a parent and you, your child has had a near-death experience like I did, I mean, that's traumatic. Some parents have had to deal with um, the police or jail or, you know, things like that. All that creates PTSD in people for the most part, and any one of us would be experiencing that. And so by the time you get to a place where you're trying to focus on yourself and getting well, they, they have a lot of work to do too. And I think as a community, the, the treatment community is doing a better and better job of making sure that family members get the help they need too. But my kids, you know, they, um, they, they were my champions always. And especially after I got into a sustained recovery, we made a conscious decision not to sweep this <clears throat> under the rug. And they uh, needed counseling at different points in their life after that was all over as well. I mean, this is something that impacts your childhood. And of course, it has reverberations in your relationships and how you live your life, your own relationship with alcohol or drugs, you know, all those things. Um, I, I was always wanting my children to know that uh, they were at a higher risk for developing a substance use disorder because I have one. And, you know, that's about keeping them safe. And I'm, I'm glad to know that they have the awareness if they ever do get in that situation that they know there's a solution, there's something that can be done about it. Um, but I, you know, I work with a lot of women, young women and middle-aged women who are parents because I know I almost died behind the shame of, of this disease and it's just not so, you know, it's not a moral issue and it's not about your character, how strong you are. It's, um, it's really a health issue. And the other barrier for women, including myself, is, you know, I put off going to treatment because I didn't want to leave my children. And we think, you know, that should be our priority. But in truth, the priority has to be your own health first. It's like putting the oxygen mask on before you put it on your child in the airplane that's going down. <laughs> um, you know, you have to uh, take care of yourself. And, and more importantly, you're deserving of uh, healing and, and well-being and health. And, you know, we can't put other people before that or everybody goes down. Mm, yes. Uh, so what would you say the best thing is about recovery? Um, okay. For me, there's this thing in the 12 step program uh, where they, they're called the promises and one of the promises, and this is what is promised if you sustain your recovery and work your program and, you know, are helping other people recover, all that kind of stuff. 
is that you will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. And, you know, there are other things like you lose your fear of economic insecurity, you lose your fear of interacting with people, you know, all that kind of stuff, which I was good with. But but that one about not regretting the past, I was like, uh, I'm not sure. Like I put my family and my children through an awful lot and, um, ha- you know, how can I ever be at peace about that? And I can honestly say today that I have a perspective that, uh, uh, you know, that I'm really grateful for everything I went through. Um, people tend to look at, you know, if you go to treatment and, and then you relapse that it's a failure. But we know from all the, the research that's been done that that is part of the process for or most of us, not everyone. Some people, uh, you know, are able to sustain their recovery after treatment, but I wasn't one of them. There are a lot of people that that's not the case. And truly everything I learned in all those other treatments, every meeting I went to, you know, while I was in my relapse cycle, um, every, every way in which people helped me all became part of the fodder that eventually saved my life. And, but more importantly, I had, I had a real transition when I went to that long-term treatment, um, just about my relationship with myself. And I realized that when, when I got to that treatment, you know, pretty much everything that I held dear was, uh, had been removed from me. I was separate from my children. I wasn't working. I, you know, was separate from my family and my loved ones, and I didn't know who I was, and it was just me. And I didn't know if I was gonna be able to, to make this work. And if that was the case, I, was, I would lose everything for the rest of my life. And, um, but in an odd way, in that moment, I, it was just me and my uh, substance use disorder, and I made, a commitment to do whatever was recommended by the people who had more recovery than me. <laughs> and, but I also had the realization that I was loved unconditionally and that whatever had happened before, whatever was happening right now, and even whatever was going to happen in the future, whether I stayed sober or not, um, that there was nothing that could shake that love or change it ever. And that, you know, I, in knowing that I was worthy of that love and that I had that, and not only that, that everybody has that, like we come into the world with that unconditional love and nothing can really touch it. It's not like our uh, disease can touch it or our actions or anything like that. It's, it's just a fact. And when I realized the magnitude of that love that I had, but also other people have, I was in, ready to make my beginning. And I felt a commitment to myself and a love for myself and compassion for myself in a way that I hadn't been able to because I'd been so wrapped up in guilt and shame. And, and that's where I started doing it for myself. I started working my program for myself and my recovery for myself and because I was enough and it didn't have to be about my children or my family or other people. It was really about, about me being worthy of that. And so I think a lot of what is, you know, helpful when people are in early recovery is, is instilling that sense of worthiness and that they're deserving of a good life and a happy life. And I tell that story only because when I get to this thing about whether or not I regret the past or wish to shut the door on it, you know, I consider those seven years a dark night of the soul for me where I was really grappling at at the root with my own self-worth and with my sense of agency in the world. And, And I had a transformative experience that really came out of that darkness. And if I hadn't had that experience with um, my struggle, I wouldn't be the person I am today. I wouldn't be able to offer what I, I can offer. And, and it's, it's the most beautiful thing that 
um, I could ever have hoped for beyond anything I would have expected in my life. And so I don't regret the past. Um, I've also seen my children because of the struggle that we went through and their being a part of my struggle. You know, they have a level of compassion and love and understanding that's way beyond what I see in a lot of other young people. And I certainly, I, I'm not in this place where I would wish this on any family. <laughs> it's not like I think everyone should have to go through this um, in order to get to this place. But for me personally and my family, it has, it has turned out to be a really beautiful thing that we get to share with other people who are struggling. And, you know, that's kind of what it's all about. It's how we stand up for each other and how we show up for each other because I had dropped out so, you know, completely when I got sober and also because I had lost everything, everything became a gift. Every, my life was a gift, just the fact that I got to stay alive and, and every little step I made to, um, you know, put my family back together, get, you know, work, house, uh, all that kind of stuff. Every little step was a huge gift because when you're coming from nothing, you know, you appreciate everything. And I wouldn't have that level of appreciation about the things that I have today in my life. And I have a great sense of abundance. But that really started when I had nothing. So I would say that appreciation, that level of gratitude and that understanding about kind of what my personal journey has been is is such a defining piece of who I am today that that is the, the most beautiful thing about recovery. It's clear. I don't, um, I, I, my life is seamless, meaning I don't have people I don't tell about being in recovery. Um, I'm really grateful that I get to live a life that's seamless like that. I know some people feel they can't, but it's a very powerful thing to be able to claim all parts of yourself, the good, the bad, the ugly, and, and say, it's still enough. And here I am. And what can I do today? Yes. And yes. I've heard many people share that gratitude is the key to happiness. Yeah. So much just expertise, wisdom in your story would you mind just talking a little bit about, you know, the choice to, to not stay anonymous with your story? Sure. You know, there, there is still stigma out there, but I kind of made a conscious decision. This is both personally, but in my professional life that I was going to act as if stigma didn't exist because I think, one of the ways that we change that for people is um, by acting as if it doesn't exist. And, and, and there are so many people who are excellent, excellent examples of why the stigma is not true. <laughs> um, you know, the, the people I know in recovery are the bravest, most courageous, most beautiful, smartest people I know on the planet. And so there's a great resource with people who have been this, through this dark night of the soul, as I would call it, you know, that uh, can benefit so many people. Um, my biggest reason, I think, is because being anonymous, um, to me, would be buying into the shame. And shame almost killed me. Um, I also watch shame be an access barrier for so many other people in a way that uh, can kill them. And um, so it's a life or death issue. Uh, anonymity, that piece for me is a really a life or death issue. Um, and people might be concerned, might want to stay anonymous because they're worried about what people are, are going to think about them. But um, it's been my experience that people have a tremendous amount of respect for people who have been through that kind of struggle and have come out the other side, a productive, loving, you know, very generous participant in life. Some, the, 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 the people who can really show up sometimes are the people who have been through hard stuff. And um, so I would never, I would never um, break someone's anonymity or say, oh, you have to do, you have to not be anonymous. But um, it's telling to me that even in the 12-step program, 
which of course, um, anonymity is a principle of the program. Um, but in the literature of Alcoholics Anonymous, it talks about anonymity being necessary because the, the early founders of Alcoholics Anonymous were worried that they would be inundated with too many requests for help. And they, they uh, wanted to protect their um, livelihoods and their you know, lives. Um, but it doesn't say anything about being harmed by people knowing about it because it's disgraceful. And I think there's a misconception when um, people talk about anonymity that it's, uh, it's a way of protecting people from other people's judgment, but that was not the founder's intent. Um, it was something else entirely. Mm -hmm. There's a way that anonymity as it relates to the 12 steps also protects people from arrogance and sort of claiming being a champion of something, but, and, and I understand that principle. I certainly understand the um, necessity of meetings being confidential, meaning we don't repeat what's said in, an, in a 12 step meeting, but, and there needs to be that sense of safety. But uh, I don't think that means we're supposed to have a hidden part of our lives, especially when it's such a critical part of who we are today. Um, it's, I can speak for myself. It certainly is a huge part of who I am today. And that may be different for different people. And, um, and I, I really do understand that. But I was a huge fan of that movie when it came out, The, uh, the Anonymous People, um, which was a really in the main about this whole issue about sort of claiming long-term recovery and being claiming that and being able to champion that in a way that can help other people who are struggling. Being in recovery for me is about freedom and having secrets is not freedom for me. And, and it's, it's freedom and joy and being able to be true to myself personally and publicly. Yes, absolutely. I love that, you know, that, tying it to that sense of freedom, being able to, you know, live authentic yeah. and have that true belonging to yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So I've got just uh, a few more questions and we can wrap this up. What would you want to say to someone currently struggling with addiction? I would encourage them to find someone to talk to who's been through it, but also, uh, you know, it really, it depends on where they're at in, you know, there's people who are curious and questioning their own, their own uh, drug or alcohol use. And then there are people who are really uh, already sick because it is a progressive disorder, you know, the, and it's different for different people. I think it's really important for people to know that there are so many um, viable treatment protocols and interventions that are successful for people. So, it's not a, a life sentence or a death sentence to have a substance use disorder. There are so many people who have been through it and, and it is very serious. It can take someone's life if, if it's left untreated. But there also, we're at a beautiful place in terms of the um, research that's been done, all the clinical studies that have been done about different treatment protocols. So we know so much more than even 20 years ago about what works and what doesn't work. And there are lots of options for people in terms of how to address their disorder. You know, for people who the 12 step program isn't a good fit, there are so many other options that are out there um, in terms of smart recovery, um, um, some faith-based 12 step groups. There are recovery coaches and counselors who who specialize in substance use disorders. And, you know, so it's not a, it doesn't have to be just one path. Everyone's journey is different. And I would, what I would say to them is just to start exploring what the options are out there and then find what, what is the right fit for them. You know, for people who are very sick, I would absolutely recommend a medical intervention um, to start with because it could be dangerous to detox without it. Absolutely. Building on that, what would you say to someone, you know, that's currently seeking treatment and recovery? Kind of 
dovetails into your last answer, but anything else you'd like to really highlight? Just access to treatment is really difficult if people don't have insurance. And also, even if they do, sometimes there's a wait list for a bed. And so we, you know, there, there are agencies like First Call where I work that can help with locating treatment. It's really hard if you just try to Google it. Um, there are a lot of sort of... Uh, um, opportunistic treatment centers out there that are just trying to take people's money and they tend to use the dollars on the advertisements that are on the internet and so it's it's really important to get with a professional who knows the field and knows uh, where the treatment centers are and what where the good treatment the certifiable treatment is um, or certified treatment is and but it's really important to have one-on-one -on -one support as you navigate that. We have recovery advocates that walk with people as they navigate detox, treatment, aftercare, all those pieces. The old paradigm really was that, you know, if you're in treatment, you're going you're gonna to have a case manager who's helping you. But as soon as you're released, you know, that ends. And most people overdose or relapse after treatment and a lot of deaths occur after treatment. And so it does beg the question about how well we answer people's need for one-on-one -on -one care over a long period of time. It's really a two to five year period after getting into um, a period of abstinence where people need one-on-one -on -one care. And some people find that in groups um, with sponsors and things like that, but there's also, uh, there are also professionals out there who can help we have them at first call and there are other agencies that, that also have recovery advocates and peer support is another excellent development. Doesn't necessarily have to be a cl clinician, but a peer, uh, someone who's been through it before, that's a new model that a lot of agencies have peer recovery support for people who are looking for help. So if people have a barrier with getting a bed if they do need inpatient, if they're not doing outpatient, um, or if they're on some kind of wait list. I just think it's really important to, to have a, um, someone who's walking with you as you uh, go through that because the window closes very quickly when people are ready for treatment. You know, if they don't get access right away, uh, for all of us, myself included, you know, it was like, well, then I'm, you know, forget it, or I feel better today, so I'm not going to do this. And it can, it's just a process that can take so much longer if they don't get help right away. So I think it's really, it's really on the substance use disorder field to answer that need. And we're just kind of coming into knowing and being able to implement all that, that particular protocol for peer support and recovery advocates to walk with people, um, regardless of where, whether they're pre-treatment in treatment or after treatment. Having somebody there walking with you by your side because yeah. we it's it's becoming a theme as we re record these these episodes together mm -hmm. we are stronger. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yes. So you kind of started down the the road during the last answer but my my final question really is what would you say to those in the prevention, treatment, and recovery fields that may not have lived experience? You know, a lot of the people that I'd say here at First Call, like about half our staff doesn't have lived experience, but all of us have been affected or know people who have been through this. Most professionals are up to speed on the current literature, but there's, there's so much out there that people can study and read about the the protocols that work for people and so i would just i would just recommend that people get up to speed if they're not on those you know what the current thinking is about um substance use disorders and mental health in general um the surgeon general's report that came out in 2016 on substance use disorders in the united states is excellent on this. And even if people take a look at the abstract for that, the you know executive summary or the short version, it's, it's uh, really um, gives people the information they need to know what current thinking is. 
sometimes it surprised me surprises me that that people who have been working in the field a long time maybe have neglected to to read more current literature and they may have some stigmatizing language or uh old ways of thinking that are more in line with that moral attitude about substance use as opposed to um, it being a health issue. And so it's really important for everyone to know what the current um, science is behind it. Um, and, and that pr I think prepares them adequately for working with people, whether or not they've had lived experience or not. So I'm, I'm, I think we're in a very exciting time in that way because we've never been here before and stigma can be a thing of the past and certainly in individual people's experience it can be a thing of the past and i love that there's more public awareness more things on the news about substance use disorders and how to get help it's unfortunate that it's come out of this terrible crisis around the opioid epidemic it's good that we have more coverage and uh, in, in, uh, in the media um, so that people know there are resources available. I, I'm always, whenever I get interviewed for the news or something like that, I'm always like, make sure we tell people where to call if they need help, because it's one thing to, to cover the story, but we also need to tell those viewers who are, or readers who are, who are reading about this and listening to it, that this is, this is where you can go if you need help, you know, because that might be their moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I love how you said it. Let, let's make stigma a thing of the past. Yes. yes. Very much so. And yeah. it sounded like a, a pretty good uh, charge for the workforce, you know, focus on your continuous learning, lifelong learning, you know, all you yes. work to grow as a, as a person and as a professional. Right, right. Yes, indeed. Well, this, this has been a pure delight. Thank you so much for, for sharing your story and the words of wisdom for those working in the field. And thank you. So thank, thank you. you. It's, it's really, um, I love talking about this. I think it's um, so important. And I'm just really grateful that um, you have the podcast. So thank you, David. Yeah, so it, it, it's a pleasure, and we'd love to have you back again for another episode down the road. So, but thank okay. you, again. we can't thank you enough. All right, well, thank you. All right, have a wonderful day. You too.